way back at the beginning of our faith, before there was a Bible, before a single letter of scripture was ever written down, the great stories of our faith were shared verbally. After long days of work or travel, people would gather together and someone would tell the story of creation or of Abraham or Isaac or of Noah and the great flood. This practice of storytelling went on for many generations in our early faith ancestry. And it reminds us of something important. While we should always turn to scripture as our ultimate guide for the retelling of the stories of our faith, from the very beginning, these stories were meant to be told. They were meant to be heard. These stories gave our early faith ancestors a strong sense of community. They helped give them a sense of who they were and to whom they belonged. They gave them wisdom and direction. They also gave them a lens through which to view the world and everything they encountered in it. And of course, the first story they heard was that of creation. They were told that in the beginning there was nothing. Everything was formless and void. There was nothing but darkness. And then the Spirit of God blew over the darkness, and the voice of God said, let there be light. And there was. And according to Scripture, that creation was perfect. Everything lived in harmony. There was no brokenness, no suffering, and no sin. But as part of creation, God gave humankind the gift of free will the opportunity to choose right from wrong. And as we all know, Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. They rebelled against the will of God, and because of their actions, everything changed. This moment has been referred to by many as the fall of humanity. It was the event that caused humans to fall from our original state of perfection and to become separated from the ideal life and the ideal creation for which God had hoped. To be clear, while humans were separated from those things, we were not separated from God. Although Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, they were not cast out of God's presence. God still loved and cared for humankind deeply. But despite God's ongoing presence and care, humans kept choosing to live in ways outside of God's teaching. Cain, the first and oldest son of Adam and Eve, killed his brother Abel out of jealousy. Lamech, Noah's father, killed a young man for hitting him. Things were spinning out of control. Here is how God responded to all of this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And God was sorry that God had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved God's heart. I think this is one of the most fascinating passages in Scripture. Here is the creator of all things, looking down on the children of God and thinking what more than one parent has joked about at some point in the raising of their children. Whose idea was it to have these kids? But as powerful as it is to hear that God had a sense of regret for making humankind, what really jumps out at me about this passage is that the state of humankind and the things they were doing caused God a deep sense of grief in God's heart. What is about to happen? The flood waters that were about to come were not sent out of a place of anger. God wasn't mad. God was heartbroken. Upon looking down and seeing how far God's children had fallen, how they had turned away from what they had been taught, how they had abandoned their potential for good, and most significantly, how they had turned their hearts toward evil, God was filled with grief and sadness. What was that evil? Well, the Bible tells us exactly what it was. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now, 
I am going to to destroy them along with the earth. While there have been all kinds of reasons offered for why the flood took place and what made the world so corrupt that God decided to destroy humankind, this passage makes it clear that the primary reason was violence. A violence that had started with Cain killing Abel, was continued by Lamech, and then spiraled out of control from there. Violence and bloodshed had filled the earth, and it was breaking God's heart. There was so much pain and suffering going on that God decided to put an end to it. It's a fine line here, but Scripture does not describe the flood as a punishment. Instead, it it comes across more like a cure. I know that sounds strange, and we need to be very, very careful with that kind of language. But the flood was not born out of anger. It was born out of grief and pain. It was meant to rid the world of the violence that was destroying humankind and give us a new start. While that does not make the story any easier, it is something we have to keep in mind as we try to get to the deeper truth of this story. Now, I want to pause here and talk about an aspect of this story that is probably obvious to most, if not all of us. But it needs to be addressed openly, honestly, and without fear of upsetting our sensibilities toward one of the most well-known and well-loved stories of the Bible. While things turn out okay in the end, at its core, this is not a feel-good story. And while it has had its place in virtually every children's Bible out there and is the theme of many an infant's nursery and childhood playset, this really isn't a children's story. Now, don't get me wrong. One of our two sons' favorite toys when they, that they played with growing up was an amazing wooden ark with beautifully crafted characters. I'm not trying to call anyone out here. At the same time, I've never seen a playset based on Sodom and Gomorrah or a nursery done in the theme of the plagues of the Exodus. And yet the story of the flood is everywhere. What we have done with the story of Noah and the ark is a great example of how we sometimes take scripture and shape it in ways that make us feel more comfortable with it. Our making it a story sweet enough to be turned into a childhood favorite is proof that we can take one of the most difficult, challenging, and hard-to-read stories in Scripture and strip away all the rough edges until we have a nicely sanitized version that's distilled down to a story of a sweet old man, his family, and a boat full of cute and docile animals. One of the reasons we might be prone to this type of reshaping of the story is that even as adults, we aren't sure what to do with it. If God is all-knowing and can see everything past, present, and future, then why would God destroy every living creature on earth that was outside of the ark? Even though as soon as the waters recede, God makes it clear that the flood didn't work. As we talked about last week, While the flood did rid the world of a lot of humans, it didn't rid humans of our inclination to turn away from God's will and God's way. It's challenging, isn't it? No matter how much we might try to soften it, if we take an honest look at this story, it's one of the hardest, most confusing, and troubling stories of the Bible. And if we are going to be faithful to God's word, our job is not to soften or explain the story away. Our job is to try to understand the real message behind it, even if it is unsettling. So, what then are we to do with all of this? How are we supposed to resolve it? If I were sitting where you are, I'd be thinking, come on, preacher, enough with this depressing stuff. Now clean this up and let us off the hook. Well, I really wish I could do that. I'd love to solve this one for all of us. To be honest, I really struggle with this story, but here we are stuck in this boat together. So now what? If you were here on the first Sunday of this series, or if you watched it, you heard me talk about the different ways people interpret what actually happened in this story. I'm not going to to repeat all of what I said. And if you want to hear more, I encourage you to watch that message on our website. 
In short, what I talked about is that when it comes to interpreting scripture, we have to begin by determining how the text is meant to be read. Sometimes the Bible is meant to be read as factual history, as in the stories of Kings and Chronicles and a big part of the New Testament. Sometimes it is meant to be read as a metaphor, as in the parables. Our task as readers is to sort out which scriptures are meant to be read in which way. Unfortunately, there is no definitive guide for this. And sometimes it's hard to know whether we should read a passage literally or figuratively. For many, the story of Noah and the flood is one of those hard passages to discern. But regardless of how you interpret it, and that is a part of your faith journey to determine, you have to deal with the results that understanding brings with it. If you believe the events of the flood are factual, then you have to deal with everyone that was left outside the boat. You have to deal with the fact that God admits it didn't work. You have to find a way to answer the child who asks the question about what really happened here and why God would do such a thing. If you believe the story is metaphorical, you have to deal with the fact that you might be wrong, that there might be more to the story. And you have to be careful not to water down or soften the story to the point that it loses its intended meaning, no matter how difficult that message might be to hear. But either way, here is a truth that I think we all need to take away. It is a truth that is uncomfortable and may be hard to accept. And you might not like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. When we read a story in scripture, our tendency is to assume that we are the good person in it, that we are the hero of the story, that we are the good Samaritan, that we are the righteous ones and not the sinners, that we are the saved and not the condemned, that we are Noah, or at least his family, and surely not one of those people outside of the ark. Those people probably just deserve to die. But while scripture calls us to live like the good people in the story, the more informative and accurate way to read the stories in scripture is to see ourselves and the people who fall short. After all, scripture is very clear that we are the ones in need of saving. We are the ones in need of grace. So that means in the story of Noah and the ark, we are far more likely to be outside of the boat than in it. I know that is hard to hear. I, for one, don't like to hear it, and I wish it were not true. But it is. And if you don't believe me, then I invite you to consider the story of the cross and its purpose. If we were not in need of saving, Jesus would not have come to save us. But do not fear and do not lose hope. There is grace and good news coming. But that's our message for next week, and I really hope you will join us for it. God is not only going to let us off the hook, but give us a promise that we need to remember, especially when it feels like the world is falling apart. In the meantime, let me just say this. It is okay to struggle with some of the stories we find in Scripture. It's okay to be confused by them and wonder what they mean. It is okay to walk away from a story in the Bible without all the answers. It is even okay for us to doubt. Don't ever be afraid of not having it all figured out. I've never met anyone who does, and I'd never trust anyone who says they have. And if you ever find yourself struggling or troubled by something that you've read or seen in scripture, or if your child or teenager asks a question you can't answer, don't ever hesitate to come and talk with me or another staff member about those things. After all, I promise you, When it comes to interpreting the harder passages of Scripture, we are all in the same boat together, and yet we can navigate even the roughest of waters. Amen.